Well, thank you very much. And, and listening to Don, especially explaining that strategy is for amateurs and logistics is professionals, I'm, I'm now going to adjust my bio so that, that I put a little more emphasis on the logistics uh, part. Uh, well, this has been a, a fabulous uh, opportunity for us to be able to be engaged uh, with you. And one of the things I wanted to say is welcome to our new campus. A big part of building this campus was to be able to set us up to have great convenings where we could work with and learn from our partners. And so the, this last day and a half has just been terrific in terms of the opportunity for us to, to really do that together. And I think it really shows the vision that Bill and Melinda, and really especially Melinda, had for this campus in, in what we can do. It's really the proof, so to speak, of, of why she wanted to create this kind of, of campus. I also want to emphasize that for us here at the foundation, constructive partnerships are really the lifeblood of, of what we do. These are very, very complex issues that we're taking on together. And frankly, we recognize that most of the talent and knowledge about these issues resides outside of the foundation. Uh, we feel great about the people we have here, but we know that with these big problems, it's going to take uh, orders of magnitude more intellectual horsepower uh, in order to be able to take them on. And so, you know, really being able to take on these challenges and have what we like to think about as very rigorous intellectual dialogue, that's how we get to collective impact. That's how we take the stories and magnify them into to really uh, large, uh, large differences, large impact. And so the cultivation of the dialogue over the last day and a half has just been fabulous in terms of, of illustrating for all of us here at the foundation what we can, can do together. You know, we really view this convening as a major step forward. And it's been great to hear from, from folks like, like Don and others in terms of how they see it as well. Uh, you know, I think there are a couple of very important reasons why we see it as a step forward. First, this has been very multidisciplinary. The fact that we brought together people from all different types of, of background, private sector, public sector, academia. The, uh, in fact, I was fascinated to have Gary explain to me that one of the things that was a little bit disconcerting was for folks to be assigned to work groups yesterday that were outside their domain of expertise. But I hope that you learn from that, that that's a big part of intellectual creation, that having that kind of stimulation is, is very important. Drawing, it forces you to draw upon uh, people in other disciplines. So the di multidisciplinary nature, I think, is one reason why this is a major step forward. And the second reason why I think this is a major step forward is it's really been about problem solving. It's been about having many partners and focusing in on intellectual creation. You know, I think a lot of times with these convenings, they can be about intellectual persuasion. You come in with a point of view, you come in knowing your domain, and so then what you want to do is persuade others. But here, I think this has been a, a, a step forward in terms of, of intellectual creation. And so we certainly hope that this has been a very enriching experience for you, and I'm very personally grateful for how you, you've taken to this, this dialogue and raised the relevant questions. And, and that's going to teach us a lot that is going to carry across all of our strategies. We have 25 different strategy areas here at the foundation where eradicating polio or eradicating malaria, those are just two of those, those 25. And so being able to tap into your expertise, be a part of this intellectual creation across all of those 25 strategies, we are all grateful to you for that opportunity. Uh, I think that um, there's a real parallel for this convening in with some of the organization uh, direction that I announced earlier this week, and I just want to say a little bit about that. This has been a very exciting uh, week for us, and, and frankly, I think especially for me. Uh, I couldn't be more enthusiastic about the direction that we're setting for our, our organization here at the foundation to go into the future. It's really, a, in my view, a, a new organizational approach. We tend to be known for our quote-unquote upstream work. Now, by upstream, that could mean sort of the discovery and the product development work and 
people will say, you know, well, at the Gates Foundation, that's kind of your comparative advantage, uh, to borrow a term that gets used a lot in, in, in business, that we have a, a comparative advantage in our upstream work. And in a certain sense, I like that in a certain sense, it bums me out. You know, yes, we put a lot into upstream. We put a lot into downstream. You know, the leadership that Gary and his team is providing, Rajiv Venkaya and our vaccine delivery, we think a lot about, uh, about the quote-unquote downstream. You know, but the truth is, we can be a lot better in both. And we are dedicated to that. We want to be great in upstream and downstream, and we see them working together. When I announced the new organization framework on Monday, uh, one of the, the employees sent me an email later. He actually was from the post-secondary team, uh, our U.S. education post-secondary team. And I thought that was great. I was mostly talking about global health and global development. And here's a case where I'm getting a note from an employee from across the foundation saying, hey, this is great, and here's another way for you to think about it. What this employee said to me, his name is Jim Larimore. Jim said, the upstream downstream dialogue fits in with Comanche tribal heritage. And I thought that was very interesting. He says, in Comanche tribal heritage, they talk about partnership. For example, marriage. They talk about how the bird has two wings, but the bird cannot fly unless those wings work together, come together. And so what Jim was saying to me was that upstream, downstream are just two wings on the bird. And that our strategic program teams of malaria or pneumonia or water sanitation and hygiene or agricultural development, those birds can't take flight unless you have great strength with both upstream and downstream in both wings. And I thought that was a very important concept and it helped to underscore for me why I thought it was so important and our leadership thought it was so important that we keep the holistic nature of our strategic program teams while we work to raise the strength in both of our, our wings, our upstream and our, our downstream. And, and that led me into thinking about how I might extend the metaphor. We want each of our strategic program teams here to be able to take flight in that holistic way, the upstream and the downstream. But if you think about the flock, if you think about the flock of the birds, what you get is that coordination where they're able to draft off each other. And so another part of my vision for the Gates Foundation organization of the future is that we do much better in building those synergies where our family health team or our nutrition team can draft off what's going on in our agri agriculture team and vice versa, where we think about how these come together. You know, I had the opportunity with Gary's uh, help and, and Mary and others to be in Ethiopia and to see the frontline workers who are thinking about health interventions, but also agricultural and food security interventions and water sanitation and hygiene inter interventions. And what that said to me is what the foundation has to build in terms of strength is innovative and integrated delivery. That that is a core competency that we have to raise our game on so that we have that great combination of upstream and downstream. And so on Monday, I announced that step forward. And I was particularly pleased to announce that we were successful in recruiting somebody who I think is a world-class representative of integrated and innovative delivery. And so I want to do a shout out to Dr. Chris Elias, who's going to join the Gates Foundation as president of our global development group. Now, it was mentioned that I, I worked for that little software company on the other side of the lake called Microsoft. And actually, it was a little software company when I joined. I, I learned at Apple Computer that I didn't like hardware as much as I liked software. Software really personalized the machine. It was the way of telling the story, if I can borrow from, from Neil's uh, metaphor. And throughout my career at Microsoft, I was... I was a very, uh, I had very uh, fortunate opportunities at the, the company, and a big part of the opportunity I had was to work on this, this really then a concept. In 1981, it was just a concept. 
How many of you here use uh, at least one of the Microsoft Office products? Good, I thought I'd get good market share. Uh, when I joined Microsoft in 1981, we had about 100 employees. We were $12 million in worldwide annual revenue. And there were seven people working on Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Office. And we had no users. And if you had told me that 27 years later, when I chose to retire from Microsoft, that there would be about three quarters of a billion users of Microsoft Office, 750 million people who wake up every day and use that as a part of their life, I would have said, you are nuts. That will not happen. We weren't even sure that software companies would continue to exist. We thought maybe the hardware companies would wipe us out. So I spent my career, 20, my previous career, 27 years, not just leading or being a part of leading the creation of Microsoft Office, but in the spirit of this, this audience, I spent a huge amount of my time on the diffusion and dissemination of Microsoft Office. That was a big part of the challenge. We had this, this thing that we oftentimes talked about. It was the, the S-curve. What would, could we do to accelerate the S-curve? I, I don't know. Is that a familiar concept that people heard of the S-curve? It has to do with adoption. So, you know, things start out kind of slow, you know, and then they begin to, to, the adoption picks up and it ramps up, and then finally you get high coverage and it tails off. That's the S-curve. And so when you're in high tech, you're thinking about what can you do to accelerate the S-curve? Because if I have a new product, if I have a new approach and I can accelerate the adoption of that product, what does it mean? It means higher market share. It means more profit. What you do, what you're thinking about here is to how to accelerate the S-curve. Because if you can accelerate the S-curve, you more rapidly get coverage and you get greater impact. So it's very analogous. So what I'd like to do is just share three anecdotes from my previous career that I think relate uh, to accelerating uh, the S-curve. The first one is very quick. It's about partners. One of the things that people don't understand about Microsoft, and this is part of the dialogue that I had that, with Gary and the team uh, that had to do with solution leverage. One of the things people don't understand about Microsoft is that Microsoft succeeds because 750,000 companies in the world make a business out of Microsoft's business. That is huge leverage. Most people don't get that. But whether it comes to hardware companies or people building networks or writing software applications, those companies make a business out of Microsoft's business. And Microsoft recognized that very early on, is how to develop that network. And that's a big part of what you think about here is how to develop the network. It's also a big part of the DNA of the foundation, something we have to improve on. We have to understand how we work better with our partners, how we develop the network in order to accelerate uh, the, the S-curve. The second anecdote I want to share with you goes back to about 1990 when I had shifted from product development over to, to uh, sales and marketing and really thinking about uh, a new area for, for Microsoft called enterprise consulting. Why would Microsoft get into enterprise consulting? Microsoft was a software company. We thought of ourselves as software people. And, you know, that enterprise consulting stuff, that's what Accenture did. That's what IBM Global Services did. I mean, we, why would we do that? Well, and frankly, it was also very low margin compared to software. The profitability was in software. So why would we do that? It's the upstream downstream approach. We recognize that by strategically placing IT architects with our customers, that we would get two or three key benefits. One very obvious benefit is that we would learn how screwed up our software was more clearly and do better software. The downstream would make us better in terms of the upstream. The second thing is, is that by us working with customers to help them adopt the technology, we would figure out how to raise the level of the games of our partners. Because in the end, the real leverage, the ability to achieve 
lasting impact at scale was going to come from getting all of those partners behind these software products. So by having to do that hard work ourselves, it made us smarter about what we really had to help our partners do. And then the third thing is it really helped us in terms of priming the pump for scale and adoption. So it was a very, very strategic investment, hopefully logistically successful too, but a very strategic investment in terms of how we think about it. And we think about this the same way here. How do we make sure that working with you, that we have the right presence on the ground so that the downstream better informs the upstream, so that we prime the pump and scale adoption uh, more rapidly? And the third anecdote I want to share to, with you has to do with the combination of innovation. It's not that upstream is innovative and downstream is just the hard work. There is innovation to be had across the board. You know, Bill and I sometimes have a debate. Bill is a technological guy. He loves the technology paradigm shifts. And in high tech, the biggest business opportunities come when there's a technology paradigm shift. But my experience taught me that you do not get the benefit of that technology paradigm shift unless you pair it with a business model transformation. So let me give you an, off, uh, an example. Microsoft Office, in the 1980s, we were way behind. We weren't even Avis's number two. We try harder. We were way down the list. Lotus 1, 2, 3, WordPerfect. Those were the companies that dominated. But we made a bet. We bet on graphic user interface. We bet on that transition, that technology paradigm shift in the industry. And that was important, but it wasn't enough. We also said that instead of people buying applications standalone, best of breed, that customers would actually appreciate it if we packaged those, those applications up into a single package called Microsoft Office. And they would appreciate it if we came up with a better licensing agreement that made it easier for corporations to adopt our, our software in volume. And they would appreciate it if we stimulated the partner community to understand how to build applications in conjunction with Microsoft Office. So it was the pairing of the technology paradigm shift with the business model transformation that caused Microsoft Office to go from way behind to where it is today with about three quarters of a billion uh, users of the software. And that's a big part of what you are all about. You are thinking about innovations across the spectrum, not just the science and technology-based discovery and product development advances and innovations, but also the innovations in implementation and delivery. And it is that combination that really leads to lasting impact at scale. Well, while there's a lot of similarities uh, I think between my private ex sector experience and my work here at the, the foundation, there are obviously some differences. And I want to just share a little bit about how I'm thinking about leveraging my experiences in setting the framework for, for the foundation, in particular as it relates to many of you here, private, public, philanthropy, collaboration. What I sometimes like to talk about is the three-legged uh, stool. And because I came from a product development strategy type background, I tend to think of things in segments. In philanthropy, I think of three different segments. I think of charity, where you don't have any theory of systemic change, but you're trying to fill in the gaps. I think of organization building, where you're betting on a leader and his or her organization in order to drive some systemic change. They have a theory of change, and you're betting on them. And then the third segment, which I want to make sure is the sweet spot here at the foundation, is catalytic philanthropy, where we, in conjunction with our partners, own a theory of change, and that we come together in ways that really drive to be a catalyst. Now, how does that relate to the private sector and the public sector? People say, well, you're the Gates Foundation. You're the biggest philanthropy in the world. The truth is, we are a drop in the bucket for the level of resource needed to make the kind of lasting impact that we aspire to. So what we have to do is we have to think about how can we be a catalyst. In the private sector, one of the things we love is that 
Well, frankly, I'll be honest, we love capitalism. We think capitalism is a great system to allocate resources to produce goods and services that raise the level of, of quality of life in society. It's great, but it's great when there's a market opportunity, when by taking the risk, you can achieve a profit that incents you to head in that direction. But there's a lot of market failures in the world. There are a lot of examples like you know, schistosomiasis or other neglected in infectious diseases where there isn't a market opportunity that leads to the R&D, that leads to the risk, that would lead to the profit, that would lead to an improvement in society. So there's real strength there and there's some weakness there when there's market failure. Now, in the public sector, again, there's the investment to try and put you know, goods and services to raise the quality of, uh, of life, but private, public sector tends not to want to take a lot of risk. I mean, after all, it's your tax dollars. So for me, that opens up what I think of as our sweet spot, catalytic philanthropy. It is our responsibility to identify those market failures where we can take smart risk to produce new innovative interventions and the evidence of their efficacy, the evidence of their success, and share that with the private sector and or the public sector to scale up and sustain them for the long term. So is the vaccine that we're created, if adopted, going to have a substantial difference? If we can show the evidence of its benefit to reduce the burden of disease, then we hope that the global public health sector will scale it up and sustain it. Or if we can figure out how to use mobile phone technology and agent banking to transform the underlying economics of, of savings products so that the poor people can actually have access to a low cost or reasonably priced savings uh, product, then we hope that the private sector will be a part of scaling up and sustaining that kind of, of innovation. So that's how we think about our role. Part of a three-legged stool, catalytic philanthropy, investing where there is market failure, taking the risk, producing innovative interventions in both the upstream and the downstream that with the appropriate evidence will be scaled up and sustained by the public sector and the private sector. And I just had to share that thought with you today because I think it's so fundamental to our work together and how we think about our role and how we think about tri-sector collaboration in achieving these goals. Well, I'm very excited about your progress. You're taking on what I consider to be an incredibly damaging bottleneck. You know, Chris Elias has done a great job of getting me to understand that we have this huge pipeline of potential product interventions and we don't have the ability to get them to the people who need them most. It's a part of this very tough question. Why do so many life-saving ideas save fewer lives than they should? And you're taking on that incredibly damaging bottleneck. You're the ones who are thinking about and will stimulate and inspire your colleagues to think about how you can accelerate the S-curve for the work that we can do together. So I think the work that you're doing is incredibly inspiring. You are coming together as a community in ways that will raise the dialogue, and we want to contribute to that. Already today, up on GatesFoundation.org, you will find an extension to our website called Scale Impact. GatesFoundation.org slash Scale Impact. And we want to make sure that we are a part of working with you to continue this focus, to continue this dialogue, and we look forward to working with you to achieve lasting impact at scale. Thank you very much.